All right. Professor John Gaddis, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Brad. Pleasure to be here. So today we're going to talk about your book on grand strategy. But before we do, uh, tell us about the seminar that you teach at Yale University called Studies in Grand Strategy. Because I think it's interesting. It's, it's a, a class that's co-taught by a civilian historian, which I imagine is you, mm-hmm. also with a military instructor. And mm-hmm. you look at military and political strategy going back all the way to the ancient Greeks. I can see this something that, you know, this could be a course at the Naval War College where you taught at. Mm-hmm. So how did how did a uh, seminar in, like this end up at Yale University? Yeah, well, in fact, it was a course at the Naval War College, and this is where I first got interested in grand strategy. Something like, uh, gosh, uh, in the nineteen seventies, a long time ago, and this was Admiral Stansfield Turner, who was then the president of the Naval War College, who hired me as a very junior instructor along with some others to teach classical text to military officers just back from Vietnam. And none of us had any experience with this. We were just thrown into this. I, alongside a Marine colonel who was my teaching partner. So I was pretty pretty spooked by this at first, but became comfortable with it. And I've been interested ever since in the idea of approaching grand strategy from classical text. I've been interested in how to teach it. And I've been interested in collaborative teaching, that is, teaching alongside professorial colleagues, but also uh, military colleagues, who I think can add quite a bit to the course. And who are the type of students at Yale that take a, a course on grand strategy? When we started the course, Brett, which was in the year 2000, we thought that it would only appeal to graduate students because the reading load was daunting. It was an assumption of considerable prior knowledge, that kind of thing. We could not have been more wrong. The graduate students were uncomfortable with the course because it was far too general and not focused in the way that they are used to focusing at the graduate level. But the undergraduates took to it immediately. The undergraduates infiltrated the course, took it over, and it's been primarily an undergraduate course for sophomores, juniors, and seniors ever since. That's interesting. I think that's that's really funny how that turned out that way. So let's talk about grand strategy. But let's be good Platonists or mm-hmm. Socratics. We got to start with definitions. Sure. Because these words strategy gets thrown, out, thrown, thrown around a lot. So what is strategy? Well, I would say, and I say in the book, that strategy is the business of linking up aspirations, which can be anything that you want them to be, anything that you can dream about. Aspirations are potentially unlimited. But they always have to be linked up with capabilities because capabilities are never unlimited. And so that's the trick. That is what we go through life doing, is linking up limited capabilities with unlimited aspirations. And I tell the students that what makes a strategy grand is its level of importance to them. So I tell them that going out to get a pizza and deciding where to go is not grand strategy. That's probably petite strategy. But life choices, whether it's choosing a major or whether it's choosing someone to fall in love with or whether it's choosing a profession or whether it's making great decisions within that profession, these are all grand issues to the people who are doing it. And that's my definition, which is admittedly broader than what most experts on this subject would would consider appropriate. One thing I've seen happen a lot is people confuse strategy for tactics. Right. Uh, so what are how, do, how does strategy differ from tactics? I think there is uh, no sharp line that divides them. It seems to me that uh, tactics obviously relate more to immediate efforts that you're making as opposed to long-term planning. But I don't see any boundary really between these two things. I think one shades into the other because what happens at the tactical level What happens when you try taking the next hill or crossing the next river can certainly affect your larger objectives. Something as small as that can be the difference between victory and and defeat. So in the end, I think it's a gradation between them rather than a sharp line. Gotcha. So uh, you begin your book on grand strategy by introducing an aphorism that I think a lot of people may have heard, maybe not so much young people, Uh, Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't get thrown around that much these days. But it's this. It's the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Mm -hmm. So where did that phrase originate from and how does it relate to strategy? 
Well, it goes back actually to the ancient Greeks, to a somewhat obscure Greek poet, Archilochus of Paros, who left it only as a fragment. So we have no idea what he meant by it. It's just something that by accident survived. But the modern inspiration for it comes from Sir Isaiah Berlin, the philosopher at Oxford, who loved to go to parties. And at a party in Oxford in 1939, someone who was studying classics quoted this aphorism to Berlin. And Berlin thought it was really neat. And he said, let's play a game. Let's classify great writers and thinkers as to whether they are foxes or hedgehogs. And so that's how it, that's how it started out. But Berlin revived it in the 1950s as just the framework and the title for an essay on Tolstoy. And the framework, the foxes and the hedgehogs, the animals, quickly overshadowed the subject of the essay, which was poor Tolstoy, who got left behind. And it was the equivalent of going viral back in the early 1950s before there was such a thing as the Internet. And it's been with us ever since. So uh, how do you connect that to strategy? So like, so Fox knows many things. Hedgehog knows one big thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, first of all, the best connection for it is just a, a, a trick of teaching, Brett. Um, if you want people to remember things, turn them into animals. This always works. You know? So that's why Berlin's aphorism took off, I think, Archilochus's aphorism. And it's a starting point for the book. It's, it's also too simple, of course, because it implies that people are one or the other. In fact, I argue in the book, people have to be both. It's important to know where you're going, which could be the one big thing, but it's important also to know what's around you and what you're likely to run into, which is knowing many things. And so I try to have some case studies in the book of historical figures who were firmly one or the other, but could not master uh, whatever the opposite was. And then I have uh, other case studies of people who I think did, for one reason or another, manage to be both. And more important, they knew when to be which. And so if there was a simple one-liner as to what the book is about, it's this. How can you be both a fox and a hedgehog and know when to be which? Gotcha. So let's talk about some of these case studies that show someone who's clearly just a hedgehog and someone sure. who's clearly a fox. So the, the one that I liked, um, you start off with the book with is Xerxes, That's the, right. uh, the Persian king, crossing the Hellespont. So what can uh-huh. Xerxes teach us about foxes and hedgehogs? Well, it's a great scene to open a book with because it's in Herodotus. It's Xerxes standing on a mountain overlooking the Hellespont, having built pontoon bridges across the Hellespont. This is in 480 BC and crossing a great army into Europe to invade Greece. And he's looking down at this and his uncle, Artabanus, who is an advisor, according to Herodotus, tugs at the king's sleeves and says, looking down, Sire, are you really sure you want to do this? And it was a little bit late to be asking that question. But they immediately launch into two very typical statements for foxes and hedgehogs. Artabanus, who is a fox, says that there are all kinds of things that could go wrong along the way before you ever meet the enemy. The armies are so big that they will drink rivers dry before they cross them. There's not enough food along the way. There are lions in the mountains who may eat your camels, and they're not ports along the way, no ports for the ships, and so on. So you could be weakened, you could be defeated before you ever begin to meet some patriotic Greeks who will fight back. And Xerxes draws himself up, and uh, Artabanus says, you have to think of everything. Xerxes draws himself up and says, Artabanus, if I had to think of everything, I would never do anything. And so he orders the invasion to go forward. Well, what happened was exactly what Artabanus foresaw. All of these things came together so that by the time Xerxes actually got to Athens and was able to capture the city and burn the Acropolis and whatnot, he was in a severely weakened position. And the Greeks finally were able to defeat his fleet just outside of Athens in a great battle, the Battle of Salamis. But at the same time, If it had been left to Artabanus, nothing would have happened. Everybody would have turned around and they would have dismantled the bridges and gone home. So that was a little bit implausible, too. So I pose those as a polarity. It's a beautiful case study in polarities. But then I try to look at the people who managed, for one reason or another, or in some way or another, 
to be both thinking of everything, but at the same time retaining one big thing as a focus. And who would be a good example of combining the two? Well, I think uh, my best early example is Octavian, who later became the Emperor Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, who was designated by Julius Caesar as his heir at the age of 18. And this was when Caesar, when Caesar was assassinated. Octavian was 18. He had nothing. He navigated so skillfully among the politics and the rivals of Rome that by age 20, he was one of a triumvirate ruling the city, and by age 30, he was ruling the world. So it's a very rapid ascent, it's a very skillful ascent, and it's a very good example of starting from weakness and winding up with strength by playing adversaries off against uh, each other. What's interesting about Octavian is having conquered the world at age 30, He then decided that uh, the empire that he ruled, the Roman Empire itself, was now big enough. There was nothing else left to conquer, and he could turn to consolidating and cultivating institutions that would embed the Roman Empire over the long term for the future. And so he shifts from being a fox to a hedgehog, but I think he was always both along the way. He saw that sequence and balanced it uh, magnificently. So he's the first of my combined foxes and hedgehogs. But I have others. I put uh, Queen Elizabeth I in that category for sure. I put the founding fathers uh, of the United States to some extent in that category. Certainly Lincoln falls into this category and certainly Franklin Roosevelt falls into this category as well. All confronting different situations, but all very skillful in their ability to hang on to a big long-term destination while being extremely flexible as to how they got there and what they dealt with. Well, yeah, the Lincoln example, you talk about this sort of anecdotal story of him talking about compasses and swamps that sort of encapsulate. So tell us that. (laughs) Well, it's actually a fake story as far as I can tell, Brad. I don't think it ever happened. (laughs) But it's in the Lincoln movie. It's in Spielberg, Steven Spielberg's Lincoln movie. Tony Kushner wrote the screenplay for this. And it's a scene in the movie toward the end of the movie when Lincoln is trying to get the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery once and for all, through the House of Representatives. It's early 1865. And Lincoln is wheeling and dealing and bribing and intimidating and pontificating and everything you can think of short of murder to get twist enough arms to get that vote through the House of Representatives, which would abolish slavery once and for all. And Thaddeus Stevens in the movie, who's played by Tommy Lee Jones, asks Lincoln how he can possibly justify such malodorous methods in the pursuit of such a noble objective. And Lincoln, played by Daniel Day-Lewis, just points out that as a youth, as a surveyor, he knew the value of having a compass. A compass told him where true north was. He could find the proper direction just by looking down at his compass. But if all he did was to look at the compass and nothing else, he could easily fall off a cliff or stumble into a swamp or starve in a desert or something. So he had to be both things. He had to be looking at the compass, but he had to have situational awareness also of what was around him. And I think that in a nutshell exemplifies what leadership is when it combines the attributes of the hedgehog and the fox. And what's interesting about all these individuals, even going back to ancient Greece, they there weren't a lot of like text about strategy like we have today, right? right. Um, mm-hmm. So how did these, so what are some of the famous strategists who made explicit these implicit ideas of, that Octavian was using, that Xerxes knew or mm-hmm. was using or not using? When mm-hmm. did that start happening? Well, I think the starting point for writing about this of course, is Thucydides and his great history of the Peloponnesian War. This is the war between the Athenians and the Spartans, which breaks out in the late 430s BC. And it's not that Thucydides is putting forward himself some particular uh, grand strategy, but in his extremely detailed history, he is writing about the grand strategies of the belligerents in this in this war. It's probably not the case that they actually thought of themselves as having grand strategies because this term was not yet widely known. 
But the Spartans had traditionally followed a strategy simply of cultivating military power and being more powerful than anybody else in Greece and thereby intimidating all possible opponents. And the Athenians concluded they could not possibly compete with these military skills, but they were a maritime power. They were a naval power, something that Sparta was not. And so they embraced a strategy for simply walling off their city, the city of Athens and the port of Piraeus, from the rest of Attica, so that when war came, they could just bring everybody in within the walls. They could rely on their ships and their colonies elsewhere in the Aegean to supply them, and they could wear the Spartans down in this way. So it's almost as if the Spartans decided on the grand strategy of a tiger and the Athenians decided on the grand strategy of a shark. Two very, very, very different approaches in a, in a common struggle. So nobody articulated that. We can just conclude it from what Thucydides tells us of of what happened. But it has become a model for people thinking about grand strategy ever since. And in fact, it's exactly what I was teaching back at the Naval War College uh, long ago uh, in in the 1970s that first got me interested in this subject. Yeah. And you had uh, individuals in the East, like Sun Tzu, making explicit this idea of, you know, you have to be flexible Mm -hmm. in your military strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I guess the the big treatise on strategy that came out was uh, Clausewitz. That was probably the most... Tell us about Clausewitz. What was his idea about grand strategy? Well, Well, part of the problem, Clausewitz, first of all, was a Prussian officer who, when Napoleon defeated Prussia, uh, became disgusted and actually uh, joined the Russians instead. And so he was on the Russian side in 1812 when Napoleon invaded Russia. After that was all over, he wrote a great book, which is probably the greatest of all books on grand strategy, called On War. And this was published in 1830, a year after Clausewitz died. He never actually completed this text It's incomplete, it's fragmentary, it's sometimes repetitive. It has the complication, of course, of having been written originally in German, so it depends on the quality of the translations if you're reading it in English. It's been debated by strategists ever since it came out. But if you read it in a certain way, if you read it, as I say in the book, from a high altitude, trying to look at the overall picture instead of trying to find consistency of detail in it, it is uh, profoundly sophisticated in its view of grand strategy. And what is, I think, so sophisticated about it, what is so rewarding about it, is that it's a work of theory for sure. So it's meant to guide the hand and the mind of future strategists. But at the same time, it's a theory of when not to have a theory. So it explains that theories cannot cope with all situations. There are too many uncertainties in the application of theory. Clausewitz himself called it friction and coined the use of the term friction to to describe what he also calls the fog of war. And his point is simply that no theory can predict everything that can possibly go wrong. So you could ask the question, well, why have a theory in the first place? And Clausewitz says, well, it's a little bit like uh, military training. Anybody who's venturing onto a battlefield will bring any officer who's venturing onto a battlefield will bring some training to that experience, but the battle will never go in just the way that the training prepared that person for. You have to be willing, you have to be able to respond instantly to situations as they're developing. But nobody would say that somebody will fight more effectively on a battlefield for having had no training at all. So training is important in that sense, but it does not predict the future. And I think that's Clausewitz. Right. So relying on theories is what a hedgehog would do. Well, this is where it's complicated because you cannot quite easily fit Clausewitz into the fox-hedgehog dichotomy. And I tried to use the fox-hedgehog dichotomy as a starting point. That, in fact, is how Isaiah Berlin characterized it, only as a starting point for further investigation. But I did not try to cram all the people subsequently who make appearances in the book into one or the other category. I was really more interested in showing how you can be both. And I think it's Clausewitz more than anyone else who gives us a theory on how you can be both, which is to be skeptical of theory 
I know that's a paradox, but that's Clausewitz. It, it sounds a lot like we've had Robert Coram on the podcast talk about John Boyd mm-hmm. and his OODA loop. And mm-hmm. uh, Boyd basically just kind of he built off of Clausewitz. And the whole idea is you, the OODA loop is you have the, the idea of mental models. Mm-hmm. That you you take apart and put back together in different places, and the first person, the competitor that can do that the fastest, will win the competition. Yes, basically. of course. But I would say mental models, John Boyd's concept, doesn't quite get at what Clausewitz is talking about, because I think that makes it sound a little bit too formal. Uh, Clausewitz was himself profoundly skeptical of models, and he saw them as great oversimplifications. What he trusted, what he sought to incorporate, into his thinking was simply experience. And that's different from a model. Experience is uh, the strength that you need, the stamina that you need, the level-headedness that you need, the ability to remain calm when bullets are flying around you. But I doubt very much that most people who are on battlefields are thinking about mental models right at that point. They're thinking at a much more immediate and elemental level. And Clausewitz knew this because he was a combat officer. He had actually, he was drawing on the experience of uh, being at the Battle of Bardino when he wrote his great book. And so I think he knows what combat is like. So did John Boyd, of course. But the Uda model, it does seem to me, uh, formalizes it a little bit more than Clausewitz would be comfortable with. The metaphor I like, Brett, is um, simpler. It's simply coaching in athletics. If you think about what a coach does, the coach draws on the history and the lore of the game, how it has been well played and how it's been badly played in the past. He makes sure that his young athletes know this stuff. He puts them through strength building exercises, discipline. He teaches them how to fail and how to recover, all of these things. But when they get out on the playing field, whatever the game is, there's not much left that the coach can do, but just uh, jump up and down on the sidelines and perhaps destroy a chair or something like that. It's up to the guys that are playing the game to make the snap instant decisions. I think that's consistent with Uda, but I think it's a little bit simpler and maybe even easier to grasp because if you're teaching students and you put it in these terms, they immediately understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Wasn't it Klaus that talked about you, uh, a good leader decision maker develops like a fingertip touch or finger, is that Napoleon? Something like that, yes. The point that he was making, the point that others make, is that um, when you're in a crisis, you've got to have your training, either at your fingertips or at whatever the um, intellectual equivalent of fingertips might be. You've got to be able to draw on on this instantly. So it's, it's quick impressions, quick impressions in the sense of sizing up the situation, which is, I think, what Uda means by observation but also quick impressions as to how you deal with that. And Uda does refer to acting faster than the adversary does. And that's, that I think is, is consistent uh, with, with Clausewitz. But I just find that it's easier to explain coaching and athletics to students than it is to explain Uda. Uda requires a PowerPoint slide. (laughs) Explaining coaching does not require that. And that's an asset in my view. So uh, one thing you, you talk about throughout the book is that some of these leaders who were able to encapsulate both, you know, hedgehog thinking, fox thinking, who they had, they were able to connect that grand vision to the day to day, the right, the, the practice. One of the issues is that once you've gained success, there's a tendency to become more of a hedgehog. Like you mentioned, Octavian. Yes. Yeah. Why does that? Why does that happen? What's going on there? Well, for that one, we actually have social science evidence to confirm it. And I'm referring to the political psychologist, uh, Phil Tetlock, who was in the 1980s, began a very elaborate study of decision making. Why do some people uh, seem able to predict the future accurately and others don't? And so being a social scientist, what he did was to collect thousands of predictions on public issues from hundreds of public intellectuals and code them and arrange them and categorize them and whatnot, and then revisit them some five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, and rate them for accuracy. And the problem he ran into as he did that, he was looking for variables. He was looking for the possibility that liberals might 
predict the future better than conservatives, or maybe men would do it uh, better than women or vice versa, or maybe intellectuals would do it better than practitioners or whatever. Nothing correlated, nothing made any sense, except that just uh, for fun, he had stuck into his questionnaire that he passed out to everybody. Also the question, do you self-identify as a fox or a hedgehog? And he explained Isaiah Berlin's use of those of those terms. That's the only thing that made sense because the record of those who identified as hedgehogs was terrible for prediction. Tetlock says it approximates that of a dart-throwing chimpanzee. But those who identified as foxes uh, actually had much more success. Then Tetlock got interested in why it was that the hedgehogs nonetheless seemed to rise faster and higher in organizations. And he decided that um, it has to do with sound bites in the modern world. Being foxes, having one big idea, whether they were right or wrong in prediction, they were at least good in interviews like this one. Uh, they could do 30 second sound bites. They were good at PowerPoint slides and all of that. And so they tended to rise. Whereas the foxes who were accurate in prediction could not quickly and easily and glibly summarize their views. They would get into an interview and say, well, on the one hand, this, and on the other hand, that, and so on. And people would tune out. So ultimately, uh, what rated as what caused success was simply the ability to do sound bites, whether you're right or wrong. And that's profoundly disturbing if you think about it, because it helps to explain something about leadership in the modern world. Why is it so often wrong? Why, why are bad predictions, lousy predictions actually made? Why do important people do dumb things? All of that is, I think, nicely explained by Tetlock's research. Yeah, people like confidence, even if it's wrong. Right, yes, <laughs> for sure. Confidence is the, is the name of the game. As long as you're confident and uh, come across and don't complicate what you say with qualifications, you'll do very well. But you'll be wrong, <laughs> right? Well, like, what about Octavian though? Like, because he was more fox-like in his, but then he became a hedgehog. Was it just because he was at that point? You're when you're in power, you're playing not to lose, so right. you you have to. Well, first of all, first of all, Brad Octavian did not have to do sound bites, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, so it was a different age in that period, and leadership had very different qualities in that period. Everything happened more more slowly then than it does uh, today. So I think it was a very different situation uh, for him. What Octavian did uh, that I think is, is really quite fascinating is that he was trying to update the Roman Republic, turn it into an empire, because he thought that would be the way to make it run more efficiently. But he knew that the Romans themselves profoundly distrusted kings. They had a history of, of that. And so he did it so gradually that the Romans did not even realize that their republic was being transformed into an empire. And one of the very clever things that he did in this respect, he said that any, any great state, any great empire needs a national epic. So he commissioned one of the great classical texts of all time, and this is Virgil's Aeneid, which is unlike Homer's Iliad and Odyssey in that it was a sponsored product and it was Octavian who was sponsoring it. And it was for the purpose of making this uh, transition from the Republic to the empire. So you might think of the Aeneid as being kind of the ancient equivalent of a modern soundbite, but of course it's very different in length. It's very different in eloquence and it's very different in the extent to which of course it has lasted and will last. So as I'm listening to you, I can see why this course would be appealing to undergrads because you have these young people who they're probably, they're trying to figure out life. They're trying to, they have these grand visions and I'm sure they're looking for that one big answer that will solve everything. But this course teaches them, well, there's not one big answer. Well, the big, the one big answer is there's not one big answer. Exactly. And we say that or try to say it in several different ways. That's part of what I was trying to get across in the book. The book has frustrated some readers who were looking for some kind of big answer at the end of it. And I, I, I do say there is no one big answer. But the other way that we went at this in teaching this course was to have three professors teaching and not just one. And Paul Kennedy and Charlie Hill and I have always been good friends and still are. 
but we have very, very different views, different political views, different teaching views, and we actually can get into some pretty significant arguments, even about classical texts. And we had a lot of fun in teaching this course, in doing this, in parading our disagreements in front of the students themselves. And the students love that. So for them, I think it was useful as a lesson in how people can disagree and still like each other, still be civil to each other. I think it was a, a useful lesson in the number of things in life that don't have simple answers where you have to be comfortable with contradictions and you will never completely reconcile the contradictions. And I think in the end, it's a more accurate preparation for life if you don't try to tell them uh, what they uh, should know, but tell them uh, how they can find out and how they can discover for themselves what will be most useful to them. So the very manner in which the course was taught all this time, and still is, I think was meant to reinforce that message. So I imagine the best way to learn how to connect principles to practices is through actually just living, right? Making decisions, but also don't downplay the the role of example. So I think Clausewitz talked That's about right. that, right? Com- yeah. He calls them composites or sketches. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so what's an example well, of that? We had, a, we had another way of teaching that relationship between principle and practice in the course. The course was and is a full year course, uh, which starts in the spring, which has a summer component to it, some kind of an individual project. And then a fall semester in the spring is spent on the classics. The fall semester is spent on current policy issues. But in the summer, what we do is to send our students out on what we call individual odysseys. And for a lot of students, uh, that would just be an internship somewhere. But we don't like internships. We want it to be epic trips. We want it to be things that they can never do again in life because they'll be too busy or too too many responsibilities or whatnot. So, for example, if they are learning a new language, we will send them to the country that speaks that language, Russia, China, whatever, and just tell them, don't get a job. Just travel around the country on our budget and talk to people, speak only Russian, speak only Chinese, go to exotic places, get off the tourist path, et cetera. And if you are being trailed by the security police, as has actually happened to several of our students, and you're on the verge of being thrown into jail, just think of what Machiavelli would have done in a situation like that. And they are equipped then for the relationship between principle and practice in a very immediate way. And then they come back and and write this all up and then apply it to current situations. So we find that that works well. We find that it's a very effective teaching device. And the exotic locale we have most recently chosen uh, for our students or recommended to our students is America. We're just saying, you most of you don't know much about America. Just we will pay for you to take a road trip, get a jalopy or get a motorcycle or whatnot, and just cross the country and do it slowly and talk to people in small towns and actually see how they live, get out of the East Coast, uh, West Coast academic bubble and see the rest of the country. And that has proven to be a, quite a popular project uh, for our students as well. I think it's very healthy to be able to do that. Well, Professor Gaddis, this has been a great conversation. There's just some place people can go to learn more about your work. Well, uh, but I guess, Brett, if I can, I would recommend the book, first of all, because I think that's a, a useful introduction What I really meant it to be was a book about teaching, just to kind of sum up at least my own perspective on what we were trying to do in this course. I very deliberately did not try to co-author it with my teaching colleagues, Kennedy and Hill. In fact, I didn't even show it to them them until it came out because I knew they would disagree. But they have written their own books in various ways uh, on this subject. So I think start with that as just a kind of a guide to what to do. And then from that uh, selective reading, it never hurts to go back to the classical texts. And if you know what you're trying to get out of them, if you're not trying to memorize every detail, but looking for the larger pictures for the, what I call the TTPs, the timeless transferable principles, it can be immensely rewarding to that. It's very important to have people that you can talk with about these texts uh, as well. So several, quite a number of our the alumni of this class who are now out in the world and they have jobs and they have families and whatnot, 
but they also have secret cells or uh, meetings where they just get together with each other late at night and they pull out their copies of Thucydides or Clausewitz or Machiavelli and they relive the glory days of the grand strategy class because they find it rewarding and refreshing just to come back to these texts periodically in life. And I think that's very important as well. There's no reason why you have to have had this course to be able to do that for sure. Well, John Gaddis, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Brad. Enjoyed it. My guest today was John Lewis Gaddis. He's the author of the book on Grand Strategy. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash grand strategy, where you can find links to resources, including some suggested readings, some books you can read taken from Professor Gaddis's book on Grand Strategy that you can check out to delve deeper into this topic. Again, that's aom.is slash grand strategy.